to have an encounter with his people and with people who aren't in his kingdom. And he begins with these eight beatitudes. Well, we're going to read all eight today, even though we're only going to go through one and one each week. So let's pick up in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 3 through 10, and then we'll come back to 3 a little bit later on. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there, and let's begin in verse 3 of chapter 5. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Eight Beatitudes just presented there. And Jesus starts off the most important sermon ever given with these eight sayings. But what exactly is a beatitude, you might say? Well, in the Bible, there are multiple places where, where there are beatitudes. They're usually kind of a one-off thing that happens. Here, Jesus clumps eight together and says, this is really, really important because these are declarations of God's blessing. That's what a beatitude is. And so he begins here. However, we need to be really, really careful with this because understanding the word blessing is very important for us this morning. See, blessing is more than just mere happiness, right? We, des we desire to be happy. That's a good thing most of the time. But happiness is fleeting. It's based on your circumstances. It's not something that's going to stay with you forever. So blessing is more than just happiness, which is an emotion and really a wrong translation of this word. It should not just be happy are the people who do this. No, it's blessing. And the key here that we need to understand before we get into all of this is this. Blessedness is contentment that one is approved by God. That's what it means to be blessed. You are content. You, are, you have a, sort of a happiness, but more than that, a contentment that you are approved by by God. So when you say you are blessed, that is what you need to be thinking of. And so these eight beatitudes express these blessings, right? And the result of those are life in God's kingdom. That's what this whole sermon is about from start to finish. And matter of fact, this is pretty interesting to note. So I read all eight beatitudes. The first one and the eighth one have the same blessing. It's the kingdom of heaven. That's the blessing. That's the result. And so everything in between is about what it means to be a person who is identified as a kingdom citizen. This is what it looks like to be in the kingdom and the attitudes you must have. Thus, be attitudes, right? So these are what you must be. That is obviously this morning in great contrast to the me attitudes, right? So we want to reject me attitudes for the be attitudes, because this is what Jesus says we must be, because our me attitudes are going to focus primarily on our own personal happiness. They're going to focus on our approval from others to make us feel better. And the reality of it is, is that ever since the fall of humanity that we read about in Genesis chapter 3, that this has been the pursuit of sinful people to make everything all about me. That has been from the beginning of history and the beginning of the Bible. Well, these Beatitudes are going to lay the gospel foundation for the rest of the Sermon of the Mount because with this, you can't really have the rest of the Sermon on the Mount because these clarify the identity of true disciples. They deal with the heart, and that's most important because the remainder of the Sermon on the Mount talks about those who have the right heart, who have the right attitudes, how then they must live by God's power. So let's pray, and then we're going to jump into the first beatitude of this week. 
Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for just the great fellowship here. What an inspiration to just see a lot of people back and the handshaking and the hugs and, and the smiles and the laughter that we can gather as a people this morning. Thank you for the music selection this morning. Carter, Carter hit that right on the head, Lord. I know that that was Holy Spirit inspired, and I thank you for that, that those songs really set up um, our hearts for what you have for us this morning. God, we pray that these would be your words, not my words, and that you would prepare our hearts and minds for what you have for us this morning. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, now let's reread verse 3, which will be our first beatitude here, before we get into some truths that we will see from that beatitude. Let me read it again, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're going to see three truths from that one verse this morning. There's a lot there. They're going to show us what authentic discipleship looks like, what it means to really be one of Jesus' disciples. If you're taking notes on the back of your bulletin, there's an outline there, and you can fill in the blank. Our first truth that we see this morning from this verse is this. True disciples repent of the meatitude of moralism. That will be the first meatitude that Jesus confronts us with in these eight beatitudes, the meatitude of moralism. Okay, you're going, what is this all about? Well, interestingly enough, this isn't the first time this kind of language has been used. Chad Hicks just read it this morning in the Old Testament from Isaiah 66, 1 through 2, talking about contrite in spirit, poor in spirit. So Jesus is bring, bringing something back that's been said before and reinforcing this. But what he's also doing in here is implying the negative to it, okay? So we need to make sure we understand this first. See, the opposite of being poor in spirit is thinking you are a good and moral person by what you do so you will earn God's favor. That's what that means. That's the opposite of what that means, is that you think you're a good person by these things you're doing, and God will accept you. See, pride is at the center of this idea of moralism because it's all about me. It's all about what I do. You say with this kind of mindset that I'm a moral person because I know the secret to the good life. I know what's right and what's wrong. My standard of happiness is correct. And that's obviously all over the road today, right? Because we live in a morally relativistic society, like morals aren't fixed. And so, you know, people just make up their morals as they go. But a moralist says that their standard of happiness is the correct one. See, moralists also have a very strong opinion of what's right and what's wrong, and they get very upset when that is challenged. They get very angry. Moralists oftentimes praise themselves, particularly in comparison to other people. They will do that quite a bit. They believe that they are elite. They are very spiritually prideful, and this is something that they can't have because it's self-sufficiency at its core. They're basically saying that they are worthy of God's acceptance because of who they are and what they've done. So they're elitists, and this is not something that a true disciple can possess. Matter of fact, this is something that a true disciple will repent from or turn from. That's kind of a biblical word. It means to turn away from this and turn to something else. A true disciple will not have this me attitude of moralism because this is the problem with it. You are building your life based on your personal performance and not faith in Christ's performance on your behalf. It's his performance living a perfect sinless life that you could never live and dying a death on a cross that you deserve. That's the performance you have to have faith in. The moralist does not have this. I want to illustrate this in a way using Jesus' words. He gives a parable in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. I think we'll have it up here. But Jesus shows us what this looks like very clearly as he contrasts these two types of people. So let's pick up in verse 9, and we'll go through 14 in Luke chapter 18. This is what Jesus says to help us to understand this contrast. 
he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. What a picture, right? But how might this look like for us today? I don't know about you. I don't run into a lot of tax collectors in my life, and I surely don't want to. But what might this look like for us today? Let me make something abundantly clear to start with, and it's this. True believers, we do obey God's law. So please don't hear me in this is that we reject God's moral law. No, that's not it at all. But that's very different than being a moralist. See, the meatitude of moralism is well illustrated by envisioning something we see a lot of today, and that's a person who is very entitled. This is a person who thinks that the world owes them because they're just being them. They're just being themselves, and and they've done all these things, and they think they're good, and so they're entitled from the world, that, that the world owes them. They have a sense of superiority based on the values that they have determined are best, and they think that they have arrived, that they are someone, and that the world should really revolve around them as a result. And when it comes to eternal life, they believe that God owes them because of their moral superiority, because they've done certain things. God owes them salvation. God owes them blessing because they have followed certain rules most of the time, which they've established. They don't get into trouble. They even help others sometimes, and they're on the right side of history. I mean, we can go on and on with this sort of mindset that is so prevalent today. And the really scary part is, is that many churchgoers And many nominal Christians, which are people who are kind of Christian in name but don't live it out, they really confuse moralism with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's a major problem because they try to live out the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to see here in a few weeks. They try to live that out and try to change their behavior to match, but without the right heart and without the right posture. And this leads to the second truth. Take note of this. True disciples embrace the be attitude of spiritual poverty. So it's not enough to just repent of the me attitude of moralism, but a true disciple will then embrace and turn towards the be attitude of spiritual poverty. So let's clarify this term, poor in spirit, because this has been unfortunately hijacked and messed up in a lot of ways from the culture looking at the Bible and people not understanding how to interpret correctly, because this has nothing to do with your personal economics. Poor people are just as greedy for money as rich people. So it's not just poor people are going to heaven. No, this is poor in spirit. It means that you have come to the end of yourself. It means that you come to realize that you are spiritually bankrupt. You confess you are unworthy before a holy God because you are a wretched sinner. That there are no moral virtues that would justify you before a holy God. That you desperately need him for salvation. That you be willing to beg him for it. That's what poor in spirit means. Now, how might we picture this today? Let me make this very clear too, because replacing the beatitude of moralism and, re- and, and, and replacing it with the beatitude of spiritual poverty does not mean that I have self-hatred. That doesn't mean I devalue myself, right? Because every human being is made in the image of God and every human being has value. 
It doesn't mean I have false humility. It's none of those things. This is what spiritual poverty looks like because we have to be dependent on God. It means there's no me attitude, that I have no resources available, that I'm only dependent on him. How can I best illustrate that for you and me? When this hit me this week, it brought me to my knees. This is not just a mere poor person who has meager resources. I get it. We live in rural Appalachia, and the distinction between poor and rich is pretty great here. We know some people who are very destitute, that they have very limited things. But that's not what the word poor means here. The word poor means beggar here. Not just somebody without some stuff. Beggar. And I'm not talking about one of these guys, you know, you go to Walmart, and you can buy your stuff, and you put it in the car, and you're going to get in your car, and you turn around, and there's somebody there. And he's like, hey, bro, can I get some money? And you're like, oh, uh, yeah, here's some stuff right here. And you get them just away from you for a minute, and then you see the news later on that night, and you find out they make 100 grand a year going and messing with us at Walmart all the time. That's not a real beggar. That's not a real beggar. You know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been to a large city or you've ever been abroad to another country, particularly a third world country, you'll know what a beggar looks like. A real beggar has absolutely nothing. I can't forget the picture of the time I actually saw a real beggar. I saw a woman on a piece of cardboard that had obviously been used bunches of times and was worn out. She was missing her legs from the knees down. She was blind and had like one tooth and was screaming out, destitute, begging, asking everybody that would walk by her for help in some language I couldn't understand, crying and weeping and wailing. And there was no way that woman got to that place on her own. She had nothing at all. That was a real beggar. And I can't get that image out of my mind. That's what it looks like to be completely dependent. And this is what the Greek word poor actually means here. It's much more than just material resources missing. It's being a beggar. So what does that mean for you and I? We need to visualize ourselves as lifelong beggars who are completely dependent on God. I mean, I couldn't think of a more humble posture that we must have which leads to the third truth. Take note of this. True disciples can then experience the blessing of kingdom citizenship. Wait, what? <laughs> I've got to repent of the meatitude of being moral and having this moralistic mindset, and then I've got to embrace and turn to Christ and have spiritual poverty. I've got to be spiritually bankrupt, and then I get the blessing of the kingdom of heaven? Yes, that is what Jesus says here. And Jesus says this in a way that is very exclusive. We need to make sure we see what he says here. Because those who are not poor in spirit will not be citizens of God's kingdom. They may be blessed by this world, but they will never see heaven. And he makes that abundantly clear here. Because it's only spiritual beggars that God will gladly save and bless forever. Because they're the only ones qualified for the kingdom. Their spiritual bankruptcy makes them dependent on his grace alone through Christ alone. And such people, watch this, such people that get to this place of absolute spiritual bankruptcy and dependency on God like a beggar, they don't want all this other stuff. They don't need all these other blessings. What they really want is God. They just want him. They want him first. And any other blessing is just a byproduct. It's not the main goal. They're so desperate that all they know is they need God and his grace. And the good news about the grammar that Jesus uses here is that this blessing is now. It's not just in the future. Yes, heaven is a future thing. Eternal life is in the future. The kingdom is in the future. But the kingdom is now already in full swing, and they can be a part of it. There's this already not yet tension I talked about last week, and we've talked about before. Things in the Bible where we see they've come to pass, but not in their full fruition, right? And so we must live in this tension of eternal life that it's begun, but not fully completed in the kingdom for us. It's in the future, but it's right now. 
So how might we picture this idea of kingdom citizenship? Let me make this also clear before we start. Being a kingdom citizen doesn't mean you're going to get material prosperity here on earth. It doesn't mean that you're going to have perfect health. It doesn't mean you're going to be rich. Even though there's people that say that, be a Christian, all these things are incurred. That's not what this says. The blessing of kingdom citizenship is much more simple as that. It's this. You get to have God as your king. That's it. That is the blessing of it. So we should picture ourselves in this situation as mere servants, but servants of the greatest king, which would be the highest privilege of all time, that we get to be servants of the highest king. Oh my goodness, this is the greatest thing ever. But we live in a culture that sees poverty of spirit and sees servanthood like this as the most pitiful thing there is. They think this is absolutely ridiculous. Because self is all that matters. You can't have this sort of mindset, make it in our world today, but we're not living for that world, right? Jesus says that we are actually to be the most envied people of all, to be destitute spiritually and desperate for his assistance, both currently and in the future when the reality of that kingdom citizenship comes into its fullness. So true disciples repent of the meatitude of moralism. True disciples embrace the beatitude of spiritual poverty, and true disciples can then experience the blessing of kingdom citizenship. This leads to the question that the Sermon on the Mount, not Chad, is going to ask us every week. Hearing these truths, am I a true disciple of Jesus? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, then here are three things that we must do based on these three truths, what we might call application or next steps. Take note of these. The first one, write down this. Identify areas of spiritual pride. We must first identify areas of spiritual pride. This is what we need to realize. Our conversion to Christ, whether it happened at 8 or 80, doesn't mean we get to graduate from this beatitude. And we oftentimes have that mindset. Actually, we're going to see that the other seven beatitudes build off of this one. This is actually the starting point. You can't even have the attitude of the others without this one to begin. This is super important to realize this morning for all of us who are believers as we mature as disciples, we will actually become more aware of our spiritual poverty. We will actually work to rid ourselves of any spiritual elitism. Because it's easy to confuse moralism with the gospel like we heard, right? So what we must do every day is check our heart and check our attitude with the Holy Spirit's help for any of this lingering spiritual pride that might exist. We must identify areas of spiritual pride first. Second, though, our next step is this. Turn from that spiritual pride to spiritual poverty, You've got to turn from this and turn to that. It's not enough just to turn from something. You've got to turn to something. And Jesus says, you're going to turn from that spiritual pride to spiritual poverty. So what does that look like? We must daily turn to Christ and his grace. It's a daily falling on our hands and knees in desperation as a beggar who has nothing and all we can do is cling on to the cross of Christ. As we mature as disciples, we're going to actually embrace this identity as a beggar more and more every single day. When we understand that we've got to turn from the spiritual pride and we embrace spiritual poverty, we're going to do that more and more and more because we know that we can do nothing without his grace. The third and final application, next step that we can do today is this. Live out your identity as a kingdom citizen. You've got to live this out too, right? This isn't something you just do in isolation. It's something you're going to do that other people can see, and you're actually doing these things. So what we've got to do is we've got to live like servants who desire no reward. You've got to have that mindset. Like, you can't be looking for rewards. You just desire to be with King Jesus, 
Like, that's it. Like, that's where you've got to get to if you want to really identify as a kingdom citizen and live it out. Because as we mature as disciples, we come way less concerned about building our little pathetic kingdoms that are just nothing and strive for this servanthood. We just want to please the king. See, spiritual poverty produces spiritual growth. I know that sounds upside down from the world we live in, but this is the upside down kingdom, and that's what we are called to. And here's the key. Our growing poverty provides greater opportunity for God to display his riches and his power through us. Keep that in mind. When you come to the end of yourself, that is when God can go to work and demonstrate power and his riches through you. But if the truths of today have confronted you, and the answer to the am I disciple question is a hard no, a soft no, or I'm not sure, then you're probably better to not identify as a disciple you need to identify with the crowds that Jesus was also speaking to here. Like them, you've heard today of your self-sufficiency, that you've made yourself your own authority, that you're building your own kingdom and not building his kingdom. And as we saw today, you can't live a moral life and then become a Christian. That's not the way it works in God's kingdom. People who think that they're on this path will not inherit eternal life. It's a scary reality. But here's what the Bible teaches. Instead, once you become a Christian, once Jesus changes your heart, once you cling to him and what he's done for you, then you can begin to live this way. And you can do it by God's power. So like the crowds he was teaching then, he invites you today to turn from yourself and follow him as your king. That's all he wants. He wants to be the center of your life and to rule over it and be your king today. And only Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, conquering sin and death will make atonement for your sin. It's nothing you can do. Only faith in his performance makes you a citizen of heaven. So this is your next step today. What's stopping you from crying out in desperation today? Well, as we close, I I couldn't help but think of a situation that I had several years ago. It just hit me so hard. This message really wrecked me a lot, and I thought about a lot of things, and was in tears a lot of times just recollecting some stuff. But I'll never forget this one morning. I met on Tuesday mornings with this small group of students, about 12 to 15, And these kids were the cream of the crop at my university. Like, they were the disciple-making team is what we called them. Matter of fact, nobody even knew the team existed. It was kind of underground. They were like our special forces team on campus, going out to evangelize and make disciples. And I got to meet with them every Tuesday morning at 7. And that's kind of hard for college students to get up at 7. But they got up, and they were serious about this. This was the cream of the crop. But the cream of the cream of the crop one day did something that just blew us all away, that really helped us to see this more, to help us to understand spiritual poverty. This girl was one of the sweetest people I have ever met. I mean, honestly, if I, if I could identify somebody that might be like an angel on earth, it was this girl, the most polite, caring, loving, sweetest person ever. She grew up in an incredible Christian home, had wonderful parents that I met, She grew up in one of the best churches in Kentucky. She never made a B in her life. Straight A's, perfect grades, always went to school, never skipped school, never got in trouble, kept herself sexually pure. I mean, she was it. She was the paradigm of living a good life. Days before this meeting that we had on a Tuesday morning, she was meeting with some girls that I don't know if she got to lead them to Christ or not, but they had recently been saved. And she had been walking out life with them, doing discipleship with them. And let's just say these girls were the exact opposite of her. These were girls that compromised a lot of things. 
They lived in great darkness. They were definitely very ungodly in their lifestyles and, and flaunted that in some ways. And she had invested in them after they came to Christ and was really wrestling with this stuff and going deeper and deeper. But God, in the midst of that moment, showed her the very real situation that she needed to understand. And of course, the rest of us in this group needed to understand. See, in her life, she had compared herself to people like this. She had looked at herself as someone who had tried to do all the right things, had, been, had grown up in the right family, and, and really kind of had it all together. But she didn't have the desperation that these people had. When they came to Christ, they didn't have any option. They didn't have anything from their past to point to. They only knew that they needed Jesus because their lives were an absolute wreck. Well, she's sitting here telling us this as she is weeping and pouring out her heart. And she says this, she goes, those people weren't the miracle. I know we tend to look at them and go, those were the miraculous salvation ripped out of this darkness and, and brought into light. She goes, no, God showed me I was the greater miracle because moralism and spiritual pride is way deeper of a stronghold than any of the stuff that those people went through. Man, we were shell-shocked. I mean, we just sat there like, whoa, what just happened here? Because this is the paradigm of Christian virtue, of morals, everything. And she had come to the end of herself, and she was broken, and so were we. So how is it that the standard bearer of morality came to this conclusion? Because blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As the band comes forward, and we sing a song of invitation the fact of the matter is this. Everybody in this room needs to repent of moralism today. We all do. And as we respond, we've got to answer this question also. Am I a true disciple? Because some of you here today, I'm afraid, have maybe come to the realization that you were raised right. You were in the right home and you've tried to do a lot of the right things and living morally, but without spiritual poverty, which we have seen today doesn't lead to heaven that's going to lead to eternal hell. And I'm sorry that I have to bear that bad news, but this is what Jesus teaches. Because if you're depending on your own righteousness to get you to heaven, you will be very, very sad at the end of your life. It's only Christ's righteousness that will justify you before a holy God. So some of you, this is going to be a first time repentance of moralism. Give your life to Christ today. Come to this place of spiritual bankruptcy. But for the rest of us today, man, could you just get in your mind this moment as we get ready to pray, a spiritual beggar, somebody on their hands and knees, desperate, who can do nothing but grab hold of the cross of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this morning. So convicting, God. So often we think we got it all figured out. We think we are good people. But the reality of it is, is when we're confronted with the gospel, we realize this is not something that we graduate from. It's something we focus on every day. God, break our hearts for this this morning. Help us to turn towards you, to have the beatitude of spiritual poverty. And if that means I need to come to the altar and pray, if that means that I just need to get on my face this morning and come to you, help us to move and do as you have called us. God, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for all things. But most importantly, we thank you for Jesus and it's his name we pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet and let's sing. You come as the Lord leads. If you need to pray, I'm up here with you and of course our altar is open.
Heaven.